Hello and welcome back for another lecture, this one on Aeolian geomorphology. So this presentation is really going to start diving into the concepts and landforms and the landscapes of arid regions, uh, looking specifically at the process of erosion, transportation, and deposition. So we've seen these three words uh, in a couple of the presentations as well, but this will kind of summarize that and bring it into a new different environment. Uh, many of the photos that you see, this is a photo I took here, uh, this is Panamint Valley uh, up here. We can see there's some sand dunes up in that, you know, cul-de-sac, as it were, uh, if you think about like in a, like a street setting. Uh, so you have these mountains that are all around this entire valley, and we have some sand dunes that have been developed up there. And what's unique about these is that they're not just normal, like, sand dunes that we think of. These are actually star dunes. So they're actually, the, the, they're like really, really massive sea stars, you know, like an actual, like a, like a star, so it's pretty cool. Um, but uh, nonetheless, so we'll talk a little bit more about um, those features, the location, stuff like that. So uh, again, Aeolian, really big word. Other ones that we've mentioned so far are fluvial. Fluvial deals predominantly with water. River systems in particular. Well, Aeolian really kind of traps in the uh, the development and foundation of wind and how, how does wind change the earth? So that being said, Aeolian geomorphology. So we study these places in where, in which, and where wind is an important geomorphic agent. Uh, we can identify these landscapes, these landforms, and even just general locations. So with these Aeolian processes, wind has the capacity or the energy to cause erosion, transportation, and deposition. So it can help remove material, take it somewhere, and then put it somewhere else. And so using that value of three, we're going to be able to learn and identify a couple different features and landscapes. Uh, this photo here is one I took. This is actually the artist palette in Death Valley, and here's some students on a field trip uh, from just you know a couple of years ago. So at this point, you know, we have to introduce the fact that wind, wind is the reason that these things are moving. Well, where does wind come from? Well, wind, if you remember back from earlier in our presentations, is caused by the uneven heating of our Earth's surface. And so since we have uneven heating, we have this, this value, this equilibrium in which hot and cold merge and try to become warm. They try to, you know, push into each other's pieces. We talked a little bit about that, um, looking at weather and climate, looking at different types of pressure systems. So we understand that wind exists. Great. Uh, we also understand that wind can exist in environments where you have more extremes and temperatures. So like, you know, a great example of that would be Death Valley. Death Valley is one of the hottest places on Earth. And so because it has those extremes of, you know, maybe being 120 at night and maybe 40 degrees at, at uh, sorry, 120 during the day and 40 degrees at night, that's a very big gradient in which you have that, you know, that offset of temperature. So, so we know that wind exists. That's the first part. The next thing we can look at is aridity, or how dry is the environment. So we have three values of aridity that we can acknowledge. The first one is known as extremely arid. That means that location has not had any precipitation for at least 12 months. Do these places exist? Absolutely. These certainly do exist. There's places in the world that will receive, uh, in the course of a year, the amount of precipitation that is equivalent to the thickness of a grain of hair. And it's usually done in the form of snow. So it is, these places do exist. Now you probably just heard me say that. Snow. Yes. So can we, you know, classify when talking about desert regions? Can places with ice be considered a desert? Actually, yeah. So when we talk more about deserts in a moment, we'll see that there's a special definition for that. But anyway, we'll move on. Uh, the next phrase, we go from extremely arid now to arid. Arid means you have less than 250 millimeters of precipitation, which is equivalent to about 10 inches of rain. Semi-arid environments means that the annual precipitation is between 250 millimeters and 500 millimeters. That's somewhere between the 10 and 20 inch, uh, inch range of precipitation throughout the course of an entire year. So to put it uh, in perspective, Death Valley on any given year can have about two inches. Uh, places, you know, along, you know, like, uh, we'll say in the rainforest regions, maybe somewhere closer to um, maybe Ecuador, they'll receive up to 200 inches of rain per year. So there's quite a, you know, a difference between those two values. 
And then we kind of use this blanket term of deserts for any region with precipitation that is less than 300 millimeters or 12 inches per year. So in order to be classified by a desert, we're looking at precipitation values. We actually don't look at temperature in that sense. So yes, places like Ar Arctic regions can technically be classified as a desert region because it's very arid. It's very dry. It is cold, but it is dry. And so that's the same thing with these deserts. Deserts can be hot. Absolutely. Can they be cold? Yeah, they can be cold at night, but they're always dry. So let's look at a map that kind of points out some of these locations. So I added this little red line here, and you'll see why for a moment. Um, this is a map that I got from uh, the BC, uh, BBC. Uh, hyper arid is extremely arid. So we see that these regions do exist. What I thought was interesting is I have the red line uh, along the equator of the Earth. And so I'm able to grab this line and kind of go up and down so you can see that it's, you know, um, it's perpendicular uh, to the plane. But you can see that there's actually correlations with latitude and aridity. So when we start talking about reasons for aridity to uh, exist, you know, why do these areas of dryness occur? We find that one of the reasons is actually latitude, uh, dealing with just how is the sun's energy distributed upon the Earth's surface, areas of extremes and of highs and lows of that amount of energy. So we can certainly see that looking around the tropic regions here, and up here, that there's definitely a correlation. We can see that there's a very interesting correlation along the equator because we know that it rains a lot in this region. So it only makes sense that it gets warmer away. Another thing that we can look at as a reason for aridity can be the landscape itself, looking at perhaps the topography, the mountains. Think about areas that have very large mountain ranges, like in here. We have mountain ranges here and here along the coast. Uh, that certainly is a reason. Another one is called continentality, which is just the relationship of the landmass in relationship to ocean, uh, ocean or oceanic waters. That there's no, you know, inlet really of water around this area. So those are some reasons. Uh, again, we can look at latitude. We can look at uh, the topography and just where is the continent itself uh, related uh, in the sense of where water is located. So again, here we are up in here. So we see that we have a lot of aridity uh, up in here in California. There are some areas of hyper arid that they've labeled here, which is more towards um, the Baja California portion. But think about this is our desert regions, really. So we're looking at places that, uh, you know, Palm Springs and stuff like that, where the amount of evaporation exceeds precipitation. So there's no standing water, so nothing to measure. But anyway, I guess that this was an interesting way. That's why I threw this little line in here so we can kind of roll it up and down and see that there is correlations with latitude as being a, a big or major portion of that. All right, so the next part is, so we've kind of introduced, you know, what I, what classifies as arid. Uh, we also class in, classified and introduced the value that wind plays a dominant role, especially when dealing with erosion, transportation, and deposition. So let's look at some different families of features. So this first list are going to be erosional processes and landforms. So we're going to be looking at the landforms that are left behind because of erosion. Um, so the first thing I want to mention within erosion is how does the material move? So there are three ways in which material can move. We have what we consider creeping, saltation, and then suspension. So in that sense, um, I kind of, it's very similar to how material moves in water, just in a sense that when you're blowing, so I always ex explain this in class is that if you had like a straw and you have a box with sand and you're blowing the air from that straw onto the box that has some sand in it, some of the material is going to be really, really large. In fact, it'll be too big for it to like pick up and fly away. So it's only going to just roll along the bottom. It'll be creeping very slowly along the surface. That's going to be this larger particulate matter. Saltation is the process of when you have some material that becomes airborne and then it hits the surface. And when it hits the surface, it dislodges other material and causes this bouncing to occur. We find that about 50% of all material moved because of wind is through saltation alone. It seems to be pretty split between creeping and suspension uh, being at about 25% each. But 50% of the material moved is actually through saltation. And then suspension is the stuff that's just too small, uh, so it just becomes airborne. Uh, we usually call that particulate matter or PMs. So we can see that there's you know 
at that point, they're now measured in microns, which we'll talk a little bit more about in, uh, later in just measurements of material. But uh, nonetheless, so if you think about it, there's definitely a, a size difference between what has to move through creeping, saltation, and suspension. So a common question that comes up would be like, well, what about if you have like a really, really, really intense wind that comes through that for material that otherwise would have been creeping is now saltating. Is that okay? And the answer is yeah, absolutely. This is definitely a reflection on the velocity and energy in which wind has on that environment. And then on top of that, we're looking then at the grain sizes. So how much energy is needed in order to move this? All right. So let's look at the first, this is our list. So I'm going to go through each one of these. Um, as you know, each one has a, a slide. So the primary erosional features found in arid regions are lag deposits, desert pavements, ventifacts, we're going to talk about yardings, and also talk about deflation basins, which are otherwise known as blowouts. So this is a photo that I took, and what you can see is that this is really big grain material. In fact, those are rocks, right? They're very large rocks, perhaps the size of a football and larger. But we can also see that there's some smaller bits in between. These, you know, these are still coarse grain and sand, but we have much larger than this coarse grain. So what we're seeing is that this surface in particular, all that sand is blowing away, exposing these underlying rocks that were here. What's interesting, I took this photo in the Eastern Sierra. A lot of this is actually basalt. So it's from a very explosive environment. Uh, the basalt then rolled, you know, blew out, very explosive. Then because of the environment there at that time, there was a lot of water which helped to kind of round these out a little bit and then bury them deep beneath the sand. Well, now that the sand is moving and being eroded and being transported elsewhere, we're now exposing uh, these volcanic deposits. So anyway, we'll go through each one of these. Again, lag deposits, desert pavements, ventifacts, yardings, and then blowouts. So let's look at the first set. So what are lag deposits, which is exactly what I just showed you in the previous slide. So as desert deflation, so what is deflation? Well, it's like deflating a tire. You're removing all the loose air that was in that tire. So as desert deflation removes all that smaller grain material, what is left behind are the coarser grains, the bigger stuff, the rocks. So if we look at this diagram I provided in the top right here, you can see there's some creosote bushes. There's a you know, little bit of development of sand. There's some sand dunes that have been moving, very small. But we can see this grayer area. This is going to be a traditional lag deposit because you can see these bigger rocks have been exposed. And a majority of this, there's some sand around them because it gets trapped. You know, as the wind is blowing, that sand gets trapped around those bigger pieces but blows and piles up into these dunes over here. So this is a classic lag deposit. There's all, it also says here that they may also be the result of poorly sorted deposits such as alluvium. Alluvium is essentially flash flood material. So when you have a, a large mountain and it rains and brings down that flash flood material, especially in a desert region, um, that deposit is not ordered. It's not layered by thick, thin, thick, thin. It's just brought out and deposited. And it looks like a big teardrop or a fan shape. And they're called alluvial fans. And we'll talk more about those in a different presentation. But um, nonetheless, that's alluvium is any material moved by running water. And it's traditionally not consolidated or anything. It's usually just very poorly deposited. Other features that we can have are desert pavements. So here we have deflation occurring. This would be considered like a lag deposit, but now we're looking at a part where all of the sand is gone. It's just coarsely knit grains of material to the fact that it looks like a road. So all of the small stuff is blown away. Those bigger rocks have been able to imbricate or you know, situate themselves together, and it looks like an actual asphalt covering, like a street. Um, so is this on its way? It's on its way to be a desert pavement, absolutely, but it's not quite there yet. It'll take more erosion and more time to occur in which all the sand will be gone, and most of these rocks will then have been weathered down and made into like a mosaic, little bricks where they get nice and tight and leaving that nice pavement uh, behind. What's interesting about desert pavements Again, we're talking about you know hundreds, if not thousands, and thousands of years for this to occur. Is that the iron on these rocks? Because it's the desert, uh, when there's condensation on the rocks, will actually drip to the bottom and stain the bottom of the rock. It's called rubification. So we're able to pick up these rocks. You know, we can pick them up and go, oh, look at the bottom side of that rock, and that bottom side will be really dark red. The darker the red, the longer that rock's been sitting in that spot, which is pretty cool. 
Ventifax and Yardang. So Ventifax is really any rock that shows that there has been abrasion or sandblasting by the wind. So we find that these rocks here have definitely, well that's it's a lizard, but these rocks here have definitely been abraded. They're sandblasted. It's very common that we see more like a pyramid shape or more angular because the wind is you know, blowing in one direction and then maybe changes different directions and goes back and forth and sandblasts these rocks and makes more pointy but smooth shapes. So you can see there's definite ridges that are aligned here. Another one is a yardang. Uh, a yardang is a very unique feature. Traditionally what it is, it's a big sand dune that has lithified, meaning it's turned into a rock in that sense because it's been cemented. And then because of, which is really interesting, because of saltation, which is occurring down at this portion right here, it actually removes all of that material and makes this look weird looking mushroom shape. Uh, it's often identified as looking like an upside down ship, like the hull of a ship, but uh, nonetheless, because of all of the saltation occurring down here, not up in here, it removes the bottom of it and creates this unique mushroom looking rock. It's pretty cool. Those are yardangs. So Ventifax and yardangs. The next one we'll talk about are blowouts. So a blowout is essentially the same idea when looking at, you know, uh, maybe a lag deposit, but a blowout is depression in an arid environment caused by the removal and deflation, uh, deflation of the sediment. So um, this is not the best photo I could find from my collection, but these are the sand dunes uh, down in Death Valley. And uh, what's interesting is that these large, or these, I mean, we're talking about miles, these are very large areas, that within the sand dunes there's these big blowout areas in between, which means that all the sand has been removed. But these dunes are in constant motion, so although this is a blowout or a deflation basin, probably in six months this will be covered in sand. The sand will actually migrate and kind of change where that blowout or that that uh, they're usually spherical actually but that area or region in which all the material has been moved will be exposed so that's going to be a blowout all right the next ones we'll talk about are depositional processes and landforms now we're talking about the process of that material has now either been removed has either transported and then eroded and made new features now we're talking about its, its resting place okay now that it's going to be stationary now that it's being dropped what are we going to be able to observe well the first thing I want to talk about is grain size so this is a, a classic little booklet that we carry um, when we're out in the field um, again to point out the fact that sand the word sand does not describe the chemistry it does not decide or define what it's made out of the word sand is actually a measurement. So we so it doesn't matter what the sand is made out of. It, if it meets that measurement, then we consider it sand. So what we have here is we're showing just the different grains. So what's neat about these in real life is that you can actually touch and feel that, wow, this is very coarse. This is just coarse. This is more medium, fine sand, very, sci very fine sand, and then silt. Uh, maybe you've been to the home improvement stores and you bought sandpaper before and you've seen that there's different grits. So sometimes you'll have a grit of sandpaper that's very aggressive versus something that's very fine. Well, that's the same idea. So we're looking at it where there are measurements of microns, which is smaller than millimeters. But the soil texture that itself can be determined by using these methods, by looking at grain size comparison. So we can look at a different you know, environment, go out to the, the desert and get a handful of this sediment and compare it by grain size to say well this sand or this material is very fine or this sand is very coarse right and then the other thing we can do is we can use a microscope and we can look at its shape and we find that its shape will actually tell us a lot about the environment that is formed or then eroded and uh, wore down that material we find that the more angular it is, the more fresh or the more wind blasted it could be, the more rounded or sub-rounded usually means there's water involved because it tumbles, and the more disc-like usually means that it's more of a beach or coastal environment because the beach, you know, the water comes up and down and splashes up and forth and slowly, you know, does that to the rocks and makes them like perfect coins, perfect for skipping stones. So we find that the grain size is something we can study because it's a way for us to interpret the landscape. So what are some of these features? Well, some of the landforms we're going to talk about are sheets of sand, loess, ripples, and sand dunes. So again, same imagery. I know kind of boring, but you'll see why. Uh, we're able to see that these are all part of, you know, it's kind of like that part to whole. So let's look at each one.
So dune fields and seas of sand. So this is a photo I took. You can actually see that it's weird, right? There's like a weird cloud. Well, that's not a cloud. That's actually the sand migrating. It's blowing from the left-hand side of the screen over to the right. So it's actually saltating, and then some of it will become airborne. It will actually be suspended, but most of it's saltating. So known as vast seas of sand, these sandy deserts, otherwise known as ergs, are broad, flat areas of desert that are covered with sand and little to no vegetation. Uh, usually for it to be identified as a, 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 sea, a sea of sand <laughs> by the seashore with Sally, uh, it's defined with more than 125 um, square kilometers uh, or uh, 42 square miles. Uh, so they're pretty large areas for it to be considered a sea of sand. Uh, dune fields, same idea, we're looking instead of it being just complete sand and flat, we're actually seeing some 3D features that are on the landscape and same idea. Uh, Lois is actually unique. It's a loosely compacted yellow-gray deposit of wind-blown sand and clay. So what ends up happening is that instead of it being coarse grain sand or sand like this, this is actually really fine grain material, so it's kind of crumbly. Um, this reminds me a lot of, and I can't think of what they're called right now, but it's it's a candy, it's a, it's a, uh, it comes, it's round, it comes in a wrapper, it has a rose on the top, and like, no matter how you open it, it just goes poof into dust. That's essentially the same idea here, is that it's like a cake material. Um, it's sand and clay based, and it's been, you know, it's been compacted, but uh, it's also very brittle in that sense. Sand ripples, so mini to mega ripples. So here is Dr. Julie Lady uh, examining this cross bedding, which we'll talk about in a moment. So one of the smallest bed forms, ripples are a direct, um, Oh no, mm -mm. direct repost, sorry. There we go. Is a direct response to surface flow. Uh, these very common wave-like undulations um, inform us of the prevailing wind direction and provide a general understanding of velocity because we know that the larger the velocity, the greater the ripple. The smaller the velocity, the, the, the calmer the wind is, the smaller that can be moved because we know that you need big energy to move big stuff. So what we're seeing here that she's looking at are we seeing these definite ripples that are in, are in existence. We can see these kind of like larger lines that are drawn. Those are part of mega ripples. We can see some mega ripples back here as well. But then we can see mini ripples within, which implies that this, that this area does not have a consistent velocity, that it must get big stuff, big wind, and also get small winds. What's also interesting is that this right here that she's examining, uh, this is lithified sand dunes, but she's looking at the bedding material because you know, at, over time when there's moisture involved, that sand will get wet, and then it, when it evaporates, it kind of cakes and becomes harder. Is it actually stores that record, that geologic record? And then we're able to then look back, you know, in these paleo environments to be like, okay, well, based on what's been stuck in that layer, maybe we can find a fossil or or um, a piece of vegetation or something. That this was the prevailing wind direction at that time. We can actually see those angles, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So many to mega ripples. So these are what they look like. Um, but what's interesting about these mini to mega ripples is that this is also really the uh, cross section of sand dunes, which we'll talk about in a moment. Oh my gosh. Sorry. It won't let me fix it. No. Just do it that way. I apologize. Um, so, what ends up happening is we have two dominant sides. We have the stoss, S-T-O-S-S, -S, or the windward side, and then we have the leeward side, which is known as the slip face. This is the sheltered side. So what ends up happening is that as sand moves, it creates these layers. These layers accrue based on the, the development and bringing in of material. Well, these layers here are the same layers that she's looking at right here. So I have a little animation to show you. So this is showing the wind direction is going this way. It's taking sand from here and redepositing it over here and creating these new lines. Now this is showing all in one direction. This diagram here, this is an actual uh, 
I know it looks like a cartoon, but they're, this is from Zion National Park. They're actually showing that in this case that the sand was blowing in one direction for one part of time, dominantly, and then it went and went back the other way and creates these cross bending. So you have some layers that go this way, some that, that go this way, and so we get these different layers which show cross bending and tell us that the environment has changed. Well, these are definitely true for ripples. These are also definitely true for sand dunes. That's why I have this labeled that way, because we can start looking at this from aside from being a ripple, but what if it was much larger, like a sand dune? So before we talk about sand dunes as an image, let's look at this table right here. What's interesting about sand dunes is that they're classified based on wind direction variability and the amount of sand available. So what does that mean? Well, this means, uh, as you can see, there's a word that says unimodal. That's one direction. So let's imagine that we are in a class and we have a large uh, table and there's a bunch of us sitting around it. And there's I give one person a straw and I go, okay, your job is to blow through the straw and make sand dunes. Well, there's only one person with a straw, so that would be unimodal, one mode of direction. Well, what if I gave everyone a straw and told you guys to work together from different directions, the same direction, whatever it might be? Well, that'd be more complex, right? And then increasing sand supply is you have sand, you have a lot of sand. So we're there's uh, in this diagram here, we have one, two, three, four, five values. Networks means it's a mixture of. But the first one here is a Barkin dune. That's your most classic crescent-shaped dune. Well, if you have a Barkin dune and you continue to add more sand, you will then have transverse dunes. Cool. Well, what if you have a Barkin dune and you and you just change the variability? Well, those Barkin dunes will turn into linear dunes. Well, what if I add more sand? Well, if it's still variable, you'll still have linear dunes, but they'll be bigger. Or what if you have, uh, again, limited supply of sand, but complex? Well, you might have some, some barkins, you might have some linear dunes, it'll be a little more complicated. Well, what if I add a bunch of sand? Oh, you'll get star dunes, which, if you think back uh, to this photo, that's what's up in here. So it's very complex. You have wind coming from all of these different directions, merging into the middle, creating a star dune, which is really unique. We'll go back to this diagram. So this, I don't know, you might want to sketch it out. I think this helped me to be able to familiarize myself that there is a correlation with wind direction variability and the increased sand supply. So what do these dunes look like? There are lots of dunes. There's over 12 different dunes and designs that are out there. I'm only going to ask you to really understand these six to make it simple for yourself. I know the letters are not in order. It's because I shuffle these around because I want to tell you a story with them in a sense. So this is your first one. You have, this is unimodal, one direction of flow. These are your classic crescent shape bark and dunes. This is the windward side, the sheltered side. These little points here, those are called horns. And what we find is in traditional environments, the horns are actually pointing in the same direction in which the flow would have occurred. Well, this is important because what if we're studying a sand dune and there's no wind? Well, we'll be able to observe this and interpret it and say that, oh, this is the direction the wind was flowing. Well, how does a sand dune really start? Usually, in this case, you just need something there, a rock, a plant, something. Because what ends up happening is that something is in place, and then as the wind is blowing and butting up against it, the sand gets stuck behind it and kind of trails around it and starts building a larger and larger mass. Well, let's just say that you begin to add more sand to this environment. Well, now what we're going to have are what we call barkanoid ridges. Barkanoid ridges are unique because it's essentially you have so many of these that the horns are touching. So you have these nice big pointy ripples. So you can definitely see there's a bark in here, there's one there, there's probably one here. So you have a ridge of barkins. Well, what if you add even more sand? Well, then you'll get transverse. These look more like waves. In fact, these look like super, super mega ripples. They look like very classic waves. They've got a stoss and a leeward side, but they're very large, very large ripples. They're called transverse dunes. So what you've gone from is an individual to somewhere they're merging, and now that there's so much sand that they're no longer well-defined. It's just defined like a wave. Well... We're going to go out of order. We'll go down here. We're going to go continue going clockwise. Linear dunes. Linear, otherwise known as longitudinal dunes, are unique. 
Well, what's, what ends up happening? Well, they were bark and dunes, but we've now, uh, we now have what we consider bi-directional flow. So the way I compare this is that, uh, again, you have a straw for the top three, and you're blowing in your straw. Well, what if I give you Play-Doh? And I said, roll that Play-Doh out with one hand. It'd be very hard to do. Your features would be very large. But what if I said I use both hands? Well, you'd do this. That's the first thing you would do, is you'd roll out and make a big snake out of your Play-Doh. Well, that's what ends up happening here for linear dunes, is that, that because of the merging and converging winds, it actually elongates these sand dunes. It actually tears these barkins apart and creates long, linear ridges. And those are linear dunes. We'll continue counterclockwise. Uh, sorry, clockwise. We'll look at the star dune. It looks like a sea star. You have multiple directions coming from all different ways, merging into a central point, creating these really unique ridges. Central piece here, they look like big sea stars. Again, you, the only way to do this, you need wind coming from all directions. And then there's this one. This is the hard one. First thing, there's water. That makes it easy. If there's water involved, and there's, if there's a water involved, it's probably going to be a parabolic dune in this sense. Notice that for this, par this parabolic dune, you have water here, and here you have your classic crescent shape. But this time the horns are actually facing in the same direction the wind is merging this time. Not going with, it's actually against. Well, that's because for a lot of reasons. One, is that uh, the sand is moist, it's wet, so it sticks and, and it actually forms differently, moves differently, uh, because you also have, usually in this case, some form of vegetation behind it as well to act as, act as a breaker. So anyway, to, very, to simplify it, now it's a parabola. So we call those parabolic dunes that we're looking at. So because of you have the ocean, you have some water involved, usually some vegetation, you create these water-based, essentially moist air-based dunes, which we call parabolic dunes. So these are your classic six different types of dunes. Well, uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, we will continue to talk more about landforms in a different presentation moving forward. Uh, we'll, we'll introduce different types of paleo landforms and landscapes. I really wanted to spend some time here just talking about the fundamentals, the process, how the material moves, and some of the identifi identifiable features that we locate in those regions. Uh, I hope you enjoyed, and uh, we'll talk soon.